Thank you. I'll be reading from a paper titled Geophonic Listening in the Occulted First World War. Rebecca, would you mind unmuting the video? Oh, yes. Thank you. Sound has claimed an exciting new role in experimental theory and contemporary materialism that brings many of us here. Sound has been shown to traverse, to transgress, and to at times efface ontological boundaries, such as those between the organic and inorganic, uh, between humans and non-humans, which some scholars have regarded as bound up with outmoded models of humanism. This movement of contemporary theories began to yield new sites in, in my particular field of modernist studies. Uh, and I think of the 2013 collection, Vibratory Modernism, which a number of wonderful scholars uh, trace vibratory science to its trans-ontological implications in the early 20th century. However, these largely po positive valuations of sound face difficulties when regarding war, uh, which is never far from any understanding of modernism. Sonic violence, such as the concussion of an artillery shell, uh, indeed often transgresses ontological boundaries uh, but rarely in ways that could be construed as productive, uh, much less progressive. Yet, as I argue here, sound does have an important uh, role to play when contemporary theories of materiality come to bear on the First World War, less on the sensory excesses that we remember as most emblematic of war, uh, but rather on sounds at the opposite limit of orality, uh, on the barely audible, and thus on listening. So in this paper, I tend to war poetry in which uh, many critics understand sound to mean phonetic patterning. Uh, rather than an expression of historically contingent sensibilities, which I explore. Uh, I also think that many critics, when they think of war poetry, are, are thinking of uh, concerns related to the individuation of a poetic speaker. Of course, sound is commonly represented in war poetry, especially, especially through uh, onomatopoeic booms and bangs, uh, the tut-tut of machine guns, and so on. Yet such sounds are not commensurate with the modes of listening that I investigate here. Of embattled France and Belgium, one might have asked, when there's so much sound, what need to listen? For many of the intense sounds that have come to stand for the war were indeed largely unlistenable. They proved too enduring for human attention or too intense for him human physiology, thus the widespread ailment of shell shock. But such sonic excesses account for only a small portion of wartime morality. My argument grows from the apparent incongruity of war to listening and of poetry, perhaps to uh, historical contextualization, or at least uh, the uh, uh, sound as contents might be another way to, to put that. I relate these critical discrepancies through the claim that during the war, many poets invest their poetry with a strong interest in listening, and further that the listening poem allows readers to imagine the way sound defined bodies during the war. Wilfred Owen wrote the majority of the poems for which he would later be known between the summer of 1917 and winter of 1918 during his recuperation from shell shock. And among these is his poem, Miners. His speaker begins by confiding, quote, I listen for a tale of leaves, end quote. Here, listen, does not serve as a synonym for heard, as listen can at times in the contemporary idiom. Rather, Owen has in mind a sensory disposition that is expectant and imaginative. The speaker hears the coals, quote, murmuring of their mind, and the moans down there, end quote. What he hears is a sign of a tragic explosion in the coal mine in Halmer in Staffordshire in January of 1918, of which Owen read as he prepared to rejoin his unit in France. The death moan of the colliers in Halmer and contravene time and space and resound in the in the heart. To listen to coals is to listen to the dead. If coal and miners resonate with one another, then the poem also invokes a third resonator. Owen wrote to his mother in a letter that he sent with a draft of the poem, quote, wrote a poem on the colliery disaster, but I get mixed up with the war at the end, end quote. Owen's confusion arises, it would seem, not only from, uh, not only between the resonant coal and the moaning col English colliers, it also involves military sappers working beneath the trenches of the war's western front. He turns the poem on the line break, uh, 
quote, I thought of all that worked dark pits of war and died. The formal break acknowledges the distinction between the colliers and the sappers, but through the continuity of the sentence suggests the continuity of their, their sonic circumstances. Throughout the poems, uh, throughout the poem's speaker, who's also the poem's listener, imagines a bridge formed from the common whispering, sighing, murmur, murmuring, groaning of the coals, the miners, and the sappers. Yet, listening also draws the speaker in and among the resonators. Their mind becomes our life's ember. The language shifts to accompany, uh, encompass the, the speaker into this uh, former triad of listeners and, and resonators. Owen lived in and around the trenches and dugouts from which military sappers delved tunnels toward the enemy lines, and his letters indicate that he recalled the reverberations of the mines and countermines as both British and German sappers attempted to demolish their opponents' earthworks. Throughout the war, military sappers engaged in what historian Peter Barton calls a deadly game in which both attacker and attack sought to outwit their opponent, predicting their movements without giving away their own position. And that, was a, that was a quote from Barton. To avoid detection, sappers maneuvered, communicated, and tunneled in near-perfect silence and spent much of their time listening. At the onset of the war, sappers, most of them former colliers, employed rudimentary listening devices. For example, some submerged their ears in, in biscuit tins filled with water to, to detect the vibrations indicative of enemy mining operations. When detected, such sounds initiated a desperate race to explode, or torpedo, the enemy's tunnel before he torpedoed yours. As the strate strategic advantage of listening became known, the biscuit tin was replaced by such devices as the, as the geophone. However, even with the aid of technologies like the geophone, British sappers found themselves discerning on the edge of imagination. Bart notes that, quote, under immense psychological pressure due to the nearness of the enemy, the imagination be could become overactive to the point where the sounds of norm normal bodily functions, such as the beating of the heart, could easily be mistaken for the regular thud of a miner's pick, end quote. Not only were these sappers listening for the intimate signals of lives they meant to end, they confused these signals with their own. Heartbeats, footsteps, uh, the tapping of a shovel, shovel, enemy and self, these signals made listening an urgent, uh, an urgent and vital activity in a context where sound has often been regarded uh, maybe as merely overwhelming uh, rather than, in fact, subtle and deceptive. I claim that the same confusion, the same urgency imbued the poetry of this moment. Uh, I wonder, to what extent did poetry that arises in around the First World War enact a geophonic mode of listening? How, how far can we take this metaphor? But first, let me square the sense of listening um, that I mean to employ with respect to the many changing connotations of the word. The concept of listening entails a range of theories, many of which are found within the continental ph philosophical tradition. Martin Heidegger stands out as an early advocate for the concept, preferring it to sound in his magnum opus, Being in Time. He describes listening as the means of being with respect to others. Quote, being with develops in listening to one another. End quote. And we also recall that Heidegger spent the last months of the war on the Western Front um, working with a meteorological unit, so an augmented mode of sensing. Uh, in his philosophy, we see listening as a posture of receptivity in which the continual forward movement of experience necessarily involves opening oneself to the possibility of others. French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy's short work, Listening, which is much more recent, has reinvigorated many scholars' interest in philosophies of morality, whereas Heidegger claims that only, quote, only he who already understands can listen, end quote. Nancy regards listening as the aspect of sound that precedes understanding and thus precedes hearing but which, in its refusal to understand, leads to self-awareness. Listening involves, quote, feeling oneself feel, end quote. A, a, very, uh, a, ver a, good, a good concept to think with, I've found. Feeling oneself feel. Amending Nancy slightly, I believe that listening can follow hearing as well as precede it. So for the purpose of this paper, I define listening as a sensory disposition that arises as one hesitates between hearing and imagine, imagining sound. But the poets I consider step slightly beyond these already challenging conceptualizations of listening. They imagine listening, which means at times they imagine one imagining sound. 
Notably, these imagined imagined sounds arise as poets listen for the dead, to the dead, and sometimes as the dead. The poet Siegfried Sassoon was deployed near Freecourt, France, which is um, roughly 30 miles, I think, northwest of, of Owen. And his poetry li likewise considers the underground sound space. In his poem, The Rear Guard, the speaker observes a soldier has become lost underground and trips upon what he names a sleeper and asks for directions. He receives no reply, then bursts out. God blast your neck, for he'd had no sleep. Get up and guide me through this stinking place. Savage, he kicked a soft, unanswering heap and flashed his beam across the livid face. The soldier strikes the body, then listens. Nothing. Striking, then listening. We see this pattern in the sappers as well. They strike the soil to approach their enemy, but in so doing expose themselves as living and dangerous bodies. They then stop and listen for the enemy's strikes and consequently become unlistenable, not, not unlike the dead. When the soldier observes, in the poem, when the soldier observes a blackening wound, he realizes the man had expired some 10 days earlier. He hurries to escape the tunnel uh, in this gruesome encounter, and he describes the tunnel's denizens as, quote, dazed, muttering creatures underground. Yeah, dazed, muttering creatures underground who hear the boom of shells in muffled sound, end quote. The fleeing soldiers disdain the tunnel dwellers who are not as trench dwellers compelled to endless excesses, excessive sensory experience. He implies that the dead are creations of their soundscapes and especially of the muted sounds that demanded attentive listening. If the poet like the minor works on the boundary between perception and imagination, but also mediates the living and the dead, and perhaps the poem serves as his listening device, his geophone. The poem does not, of course, detect the furtive sounds of an enemy, but neither did the geophone primarily capture the sounds which it sought. Instead, soldiers listened without clarity or understanding, and from these periods of unfulfilled listening arose imagined sound. Perhaps listening te technologies, first and foremost, then, are those that facilitate the imagination of sound, uh, and only secondly apprehend what they see. If so, then the poems I'm considering here indeed do listen geophonically. Of course, the geophone was not the only technology changing the way one listened to war, and British soldiers were not the only ones to realize new modes of listening in verse. The American poet and theorist Amy Lowell traveled from Boston to Liverpool in June of 1914, and in February of 1915, Germany began its unfettered use of U-boat submarines, which turned the, Irish, or the South Irish Sea into what one Royal Naval officer remembered as, quote, a veritable graveyard for shipping of all sorts, end quote. Of course, it was also a graveyard for hundreds of soldiers, uh, both soldiers and uh, sailors, hundreds of sailors, both soldiers and civilians were born to the bottom of the ocean, in the closed chambers of their ships. On May 7th, 1915, a German U-boat sank the passenger ship Lusitania, and Lowell's former companion lover, Elizabeth Seacombe, drowned along with uh, 1,958 others. So historians often use this moment to mark an unprecedented mode of warfare in which vision no longer could account for naval threats. Instead, if any warning came of a U-boat's sudden strike, it came from listening to the ocean. Following the outbreak of the war, the Royal Navy began work at the Cock Craig Research Center in Edinburgh to develop what would become known as the hydrophone, a device capable of recognizing the sonic signatures of the German U-boat. Listening at the boundary between what could be heard and what could not be heard contributed to this, this oral imaginary that we also see with the geophone. But what begins as a historical and a martial practice soon inspires writers like Lowell, who, through their proximity to the conflict, came to recognize the value of poetry that sounded and listened in the context of war. In her five-part long poem, The Hammers, from her wartime collection, Men, Women, and Ghosts, Lowell merges a series of vignettes through the refrain of hammers, tap, tap, tap. Although the scenes roughly span the period between the beginning of the French Revolution and the death of Napoleon, Lowell explains that the sonic events she has in mind were in fact inspired by the First World War and its unprecedented, unprecedented oral scenarios. Uh, 
She would later write that all of her poems owe their existence to the war. This explanation will considered alongside her wartime poetry's recurring naval themes and her various representations of sound lead me to believe that poems such as The Hammers are deeply invested in the question of how does a poem listen, and especially to modern war. The first section of The Hammers describes the construction of British warships in Kent as the conflict with France escalated. Craftsmen tap tap until a ship, quote, t shakes and quivers upon the waves. Uh, and then later, the wind screeches and flaps the flags till they pound like hammers, end quote. So here the sounding hammers seem to impart various resonances on the ship. Um, the craftsman tapping calls to mind the denotation of sound that comes down from the German gesund, uh, which we may translate as health. Uh, by sounding the hulls of these ships of war, the craftsmen make resonant the integrity of the vessels and presumably the safety of its crew. Yet both in Napoleonic and modern warfare, sound halls also became like sound tombs to many unfortunate passengers, especially if the vessel sunk quickly, as in the case of the Lusitania. It's thus with morbid irony, rather than uh, triumphalism, that Lowell concludes her poem with the tap-tap of hammers. Oops. There we go. It's thus with morbid irony, rather than triumphalism, that Lowell concludes her poem with a tap-tap of hammers upon the coffin of the one-time Emperor Napoleon. In depicting the coffin sounding, Lowell suggests the sounded ships that open the poem likewise became coffins. Conversely, Napoleon should call to mind a category of, uh, of the dead, those dead sealed up with sound or in the midst of sonic processes. The craftsmen make the sa coffin sound and sound the coffin, yet whereas sappers also listened for the sound of their enemies striking picks, neither craftsmen nor emperors strive to hear one another in this, in this scenario. The, ha the, the hammers go tap tap in the ears which do not heed. That was a quote from this selection. These figures in, with which the poem closes are no longer engaged in the kind of geophonic listening that marked war experience. Rather, the sounding and listening of war have been partitioned. The craftsmen beat with hammers that do not wrist detection and thus uh, uh, separate themselves, separate the, the sounder uh, from death and its intimacy with the listening experience. Here is war without listening, which is to say, here is war in which the living and the dead need not cooperate. I conclude simply then, poetic listening to the dead poetic listening as the dead and the, the gravity of their coincidence are not as many of, uh, as may be supposed um, signs of a coherent and reified self, a poetic self perhaps, but rather something near the opposite, an urgent striving toward new ways of being over and against the insensibility of sonic violence. Thank you.